Steve Purden, I'm chair of the uh, staff assembly here at SUNY IT, and I'd like to welcome you to SUNY BEST. SUNY BEST is a program that brings together business, education, economic development, professionals, and labor. It's intended to leverage the resource of community partners with a focus on revitalizing the quality of life in this region. SUNY BEST in the Mohawk Valley will be organized and facilitated by the SUNY IT Office of Continuing Professional Education in conjunction with the Center for Global Advanced Manufacturing, which is a multi-regional nonprofit organization focused on providing resources for the manufacturing sector companies. Today, the Mohawk Valley and the Utica Rome area has a rich history in aviation. Just a little bit to the west of us is the former site of the Utica Airport, which is now the site of the Walmart Distribution Center. Many are familiar with the former Oneida County Airport located in Whitestown, which was the home of Mohawk Airlines, Empire Airlines, its jet training center. And of course, we know the rich history of the Griffiths Air Force Base. It was named after Townsend Griffiths, who was born in Buffalo, New York. Griffiths was the first US airman to be killed in the line of duty in Europe during World War II. On the 1st of February, 1942, the site was named the Rome Air Depot. The Air Force and Army separated into separate branches in 1947, and in 1948, Griffiths, uh, the name was changed to the Griffiths Air Force Base. Obviously, tenants at the uh, Air Base included the, the Rome Air Development Center, which today we know as Rome Labs. It was the home of the 49th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, the 416th Bomb Wing, the original uh, movement from Syracuse to Griffiths of the Northeast Air Defense Sector, which remains as a guard unit known as the Eastern Air Defense Sector. In 1995, with the Base Realignment and Closure Commission, the uh, flying components in the base was uh, closed down with a few components uh, that I just mentioned still remaining. The uh, base's runway served as a reliever for Fort Drum for a number of years as the base uh, after the base closure until the Fort Drum runway was extended to accommodate uh, Army aircraft uh, transport. In 2007, Oneida County moved its airport from the Whitestown site to the former Griffiths Air Force Base, which is now known as the Griffiths International Airport. With a focus on attracting maintenance, rehabilitation, and overhaul companies known as MRO. Two primary tenants there today include Midair USA and Premier Aviation. The evolution continues at the Griffiths International Airport with the planned design and construction of a terminal building. It also, in this evolution, we now look at the change of the United States airspace system with the incorporation of unmanned aerial vehicles. And today's presentation is on the Griffiths International Airport being selected by the FAA as a site for a test program with the Northeast Unmanned Aerial Systems Airspace Integration Research Alliance called New Air. With us today is uh, Larry Brinker, who is uh, the Executive Director and General Counsel of the New Air Alliance. His presentation will discuss the Federal Aviation Administration's program to integrate unmanned aerial systems into the national aerospace system. The role of the Northeast uh, UAS Airspace Integration Research Alliance and Griffiths International Airport in that program and the potential civil and commercial market in the United States. Larry Brinker is an experienced pilot and aviation attorney providing advice and counsel to his clients on public policy issues, regulatory compliance, business development matters, and acquisitions and government contracting in the aerospace, defense, agribusiness, and energy sectors. Larry has over 40 years of successful leadership experience that include both government and private sector responsibilities. He held key executive positions with the uh, Building Industry Association of New York City uh, as Executive Vice President, Express One International as President and General Counsel, Airtran Airways and Airtran Holdings as General Counsel and Corporate Secretary, Mountain Air Cargo as Director of Operations, 
Colgan Airways, uh, Director of Safety and General Counsels, and uh, Aero Turbine as Vice, Vice President and General Counsel. His corporate clients have included Asiana Airlines, Virgin Atlantic, Belgian Challenger Air, uh, Garud Indonesia Airlines, Agfa, the country of uh, Moldova and other international domestic companies, as well as numerous small nonprofit uh, and business organizations. He retired from the United States Air Force after 25 years of uh, active and reserve service. During his military career, he attained the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and held various positions, including a command pilot, intelligence officer, operations officer, ethics counsel, congressional liaison, and squadron commander. Larry is an FAA rated airline transport pilot with multiple type ratings and over 8,000 international and domestic flying hours. He's an FAA rated flight engineer in turbojet aircraft. He also served as an FAA aviation safety inspector in the air carrier branch. His public service includes being elected to the South Carolina House of Representatives, appointed by President uh, Ronald Reagan as special assistant to public affairs for veterans and labor issues, Transportation Council for uh, Bob Dole for presidential campaign, legislative liaison to the Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Special Operations Command, legislative liaison, United States House of Representatives to the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, Transportation Council for New York State Senator Thomas Libis, and New York Governor George Pataki, and Director of Government Relations for the Greater Binghamton Chamber of Commerce. He attended the U.S. Naval Academy and graduated from the Citadel with a bachelor's in political science. He earned an MBA from Southern Illinois University and a Juris Doctorate degree from Atlanta Law School. He's a member of the Federal Bar Association, Georgia Bar Association, the NTSB Bar Association, the Air Force Association, the Civil Air Patrol, Lawyer Pilots Bar Association, and serves as a panel attorney on the AOPA, the Airport Owners and Pilots Association Legal Services Panel. Please join me in welcoming to SUNY Best, Larry Brinker. Well, thank you all very much for coming out today. Uh, you can just call me the drone guy. That makes it nice and easy. And Steve, thank you for having me today. Um, I didn't realize you're going to read that entire thing, but yes, I am that old. One of the things that is very important to the success of the civilian, civilian application of unmanned aerial systems is a good understanding by the public and support by the public of what we're trying to accomplish. Up to this point, most of the media reporting on unmanned aerial systems has been all about the military use, the killer drone. Now I'm here to tell you today that this is not about killer drones. This is about drones that can save your life, that can save somebody else's life, that can protect our first responders, that can aid our farmers in growing more food to feed the next generation of hungry people, and on and on and on. So I'm going to I have a short presentation to tell you a little bit about who we are, how we got to Griffiths in the first place and what our intentions are, but I, I intend to leave a lot of time for questions, so be thinking of your questions, uh, because I want to hear from, from you all as well. The Northeast UAS Integration Research and Development and whatever the rest of that long name is, I can never remember, but we go by New Air. Very important, because UAS operations in the National Airspace System are the next new thing in aviation without question. The New Air Alliance is a New York not-for-profit made up of over 40 combined public and private entities, academic institutions, that we all put together a couple of years ago to be able to bid on one of the FAA test ranges, and I'll talk about that as, as we get into the chronological order. Um, the alliance is teamed with Griffiths International Airport. Griffiths International Airport is the named FAA test site operator, 
and the New Air Alliance is the test site manager under our teaming agreement with Griffiths. About four years ago, the demand in the United States began to build for operation of UAS in the commercial sector. But there were no rules, no regulations. The FAA didn't pay much attention to it. And so all of those uh, entrepreneurs and uh, devotees, if you will, of unmanned systems uh, began to get frustrated with the slow pace of the United States adopting unmanned systems in civil and commercial use. So they went to Congress and worked Congress for a couple of years talking about the benefit that it would be to have the ability to operate UAS in the commercial system. Congress finally passed a bill that was signed by the President in, on Valentine's Day, actually, in 2012. Uh, the FAA, the 2012 FAA Modernization and Reform Act of 2012, and that required the FAA to begin integrating unmanned systems into the national airspace system. Up to that point, there had not been um, any real effort by the FAA to take this new technology and incorporate it into everyday life. And I have to say that a big part of our success here in New York is owed to our congressional members that really supported this from the very beginning. Congressman Richard Hanna, Senator Chuck Schumer, really led the charges in their houses of Congress to make this a reality. And not only did they get the legislation passed, but they stood with us shoulder to shoulder as we went through the application process and worked with us in every possible manner to bring this opportunity to New York, so I have to give them credit. Oftentimes, elected officials don't get credit for some of the things that they should get credit for, and they get blamed for other things. This time, they really get credit for this. This is truly a creation of Congress. The FAA, though, <clears throat> in typical FAA fashion, didn't do anything. They kind of hemmed and hawed and dragged their feet, and Congress kept beating on them, beating on them. Finally, a year later, in February of 2013, they issued their request for information so that all of those uh, organizations that wanted to bid on these six test ranges could do so. Um, and they said, oh, and by the way, the team leader has to be a non-federal public entity. Well, that threw a monkey wrench into everything because there were no non-federal public entities out there that were, that were looking to bid on these things. There were some private institutions. Uh, there were some not-for-profits like us. So anyway, thanks again to our congressional delegation who got us a, a five-day stay on filing our application. We were able to, uh, through the good graces of Oneida County and Griffiths International Airport, get them to step up and take the lead to be the non-federal public entity, and we team with Griffiths. So that's how Griffiths got to be the leader in this. They were always going to be a part of the operation, but uh, when the FAA threw us that curve, they stepped up and hit it out of the park, and we thank them very much for that, and particularly uh, Tony Pacenti, the Oneida County uh, executive. So we put in our bid, as did 52 other applicants. The FAA cut the bid back, or cut the applications back to 25, which they deemed as being fully qualified, of which we were one of those. And then we sat and sat and sat, heard nothing, heard nothing, heard nothing. And then finally, on December the 30th, 2013, they made the selection announcement and, and we won. We were one of six in the country that are going to support the FAA in their integration of UAS in the national airspace system. Okay, what is a UAS, UAV? For those of you that caught 60 Minutes, you can call it a drone if you want. It's not really a drone, but you can call it a drone if you want. We've accepted that. But what it is, a UAV is an unmanned aerial vehicle. 
and it refers to remotely piloted or autonomous vehicles, but it is just the piece that's flying in the air. The unmanned aircraft system includes the ground control station, the control link, and all the other technology that supports that unmanned aerial vehicle. And that's really an important distinction and one of the things that separates this challenge for the FAA from other challenges of manned aircraft. This is a technology business with an aviation component. It is not just an airplane. It is, it is in really very limited fashion similar to, to aircraft. I mean, it's a, it's a vehicle that flies, but the technology that supports it and controls it is really the key to success here. The purpose of the test site is going to be to support the FAA's development of the information necessary to issue regulations to incorporate UAS into the national airspace system. Because unmanned systems have only been operated heretofore for the most part by the U.S. military, the FAA has no civil information. And they, they admit that. They have nothing in their databases about how to go about certifying the safety or the airworthiness of unmanned aerial vehicles and unmanned aerial systems. So that's what we're going to do at these six test ranges. We're going to be conducting various kinds of tests, gathering that information, getting it to the FAA so they can analyze it and come up with a set of rules to allow for flight and civil and commercial use. This uh, the fellow standing over here is from uh, one of our clients. The device he's holding, the DT-18, has been flown and certified in France for a number of years. It flies pipeline patrol, it flies agricultural um, support. Um, they're going to come to Griffiths and get that DT-18 certified to fly in the United States. One of the great strengths of our proposal was our existing infrastructure. We have contained within New York, the New York piece, by the way, we partnered with Massachusetts, and I'll get to that in a minute. Contained within New York, we have the perfect example of how to move from a manned aircraft system to an unmanned system, and that's the 174th National Guard unit at Hancock. Prior to unmanned systems and, and introduction of unmanned systems into the uh, Air Force, they flew F-16s. They transitioned from F-16s over to the MQ-9 unmanned system, and now they are the, the training facility for the Air Force for the MQ-9. No matter what unit is flying MQ-9s, they're all trained at Hancock. So while the FAA would not allow federal entities to partner with any of the test range applicants, we have several retired members of the 174th that are on our team, and we have a great relationship with the 174th for current modern day data. That was really helpful. In addition to that, of course, we have Fort Drum, the research labs at Rome, um, all the ones that, uh, that uh, Steve mentioned. I just want to point out, too, though, that are, that are kind of the basis of our system. Griffiths International Airport, obviously, here in Rome and the former Otis Air National Guard base at Joint Base Cape Cod. And that's the partnership of Massachusetts and New York. The FAA is allowing us to use any airspace that we can make the safety case for and the environmental case for, for testing. And so we will do that. Um, but those are the two locations that, that we're going to build our um, testing infrastructure from. For those of you that aren't too familiar with what goes on out at Air Force Research Laboratory, I can't tell you, because they won't tell me either. Uh, but we know what's going to go on for, for us out there. We're going to do, uh, we're gonna, we, we have a, a co cooperative agreement with the labs, 
and we're going to be testing some small UAVs out there. They have a COA, a Certificate of Authorization, a waiver, to test small UAS, 55 pounds or less, in about a four square mile um, piece of airspace. So we're going to be using them as a, uh, a helpmate, if you will, in establishing some of the testing protocols, carrying out some of the tests, and obviously sharing data with them as well. One of the real benefits that the FAA saw in our application over some other applications was the alliance. I mean, everybody's heard about everybody wanting to have a public-private partnership. We really have one of those. And that helped us put together our 65-page application to present to FAA and really helped us win. No doubt about it. This is not everybody that's involved, but this will give you some idea of the um, mixture of private sector and public partners that we have. I want to point out, whoops, wrong button, sorry. Center State CEO, which is headquartered in Syracuse, and Mass Development from Massachusetts. Part of the significance of the New Air Alliance is that we went into this project not just looking at the science that had to be developed to integrate UAS into the national airspace system, but the business. We know that the science is very important. We, we can't get to the business without the science, but we have to get to the business end of UAS to really make this opportunity pay off for New York and Massachusetts. And so that's why those two organizations, which are economic development organizations of their state, Center State for Central uh, New York and Mass Development for all of Massachusetts, is heavily involved in what we're doing. And so every time we meet with a manufacturer or a developer that wants to test their product on our test range, uh, they also get a chance to discuss about locating, developing, building in Massachusetts or New York. And we think that's a really good combination of how to approach this opportunity. These are some of the academic institutions that are involved. Obviously, SUNY IT has been involved from the very beginning. Um, but I want to point out this one right here. You see little tiny Mohawk Valley Community College in bold. And the reason they're there is because they have stepped up and they're going to add to their training at Griffiths. They're going to add a unmanned aerial system training center at Griffiths to support the test range activities and to support the manufacturers and to support the development of what's going to be the next generation of pilots. So we're very proud to work with Mohawk Valley Community College on that particular aspect. By the way, these guys right here from Cornell University real proud of those guys. They uh, got together and they won the AUVSI, and for those of you who don't know what AUVSI is, it's the International Trade Association for Unmanned Systems. And the guys from Cornell won the international competition for building a UAS in 2013. That fact was not lost on the FAA, that we have that kind of expertise available here in New York and Massachusetts. As I mentioned, there were 50 applicants for the test range, which doesn't really reflect all the team members. And they, were, they came from 37 states. These are the six that were selected. You can see there were um, three universities that backed uh, three of the winning applicants. Uh, two states, and Griffiths International Airport, which is also partnered with Massachusetts. 
Each one of the test ranges has certain unique characteristics, locations, topography, um, you name it. Uh, you can contain within the six sites is virtually every kind of testing opportunity that you can imagine. And so the FAA did a pretty good job of laying that out. Uh, even though we're competitors, the six sites were friendly competitors, and we worked together um, to establish the protocol for testing. So for example, if you come to us and the first test you want to run has to do with cold weather, we got plenty of that, so we'll, we'll do that. And then let's say in order to get this thing certified and get an airworthiness certificate, you have to have hot, high desert testing. We'll send you out to our, to our colleagues in Nevada to complete that testing so we can work together to get this industry moving. And that's, if I, I'll say that many times, but what this project is all about is developing the industry. And why is that important? Now, let me tell you, we didn't make these numbers up. These numbers come from two different and independent studies of the potential economic impact that unmanned systems will have in this country. And I think it's very important to notice that the industry itself, through the AUVSI study, is talking about just in three years, $443 million and 2,276 jobs nationwide. And again, I, I, go back to, I go back to the old 60 Minutes piece this Sunday. I, I, have, to, I have to thank CBS and 60 Minutes for uh, giving me an intro like that. I, for those of you that didn't catch it, it was about the development of UAS and how big they think the market is really going to be. And it's in the billions. This is some of the numbers for the local area. Everybody asks me, how many jobs are we going to have at New Air? And I tell them, not that many, probably 25 to 50. But where the job growth is going to come, are all, you saw all of those companies that were on that list back there? Every one of those companies has something to gain from the growth of the UAS industry. So it's going to be companies like AIS, located at Griffiths, that'll add jobs because to support the um, unmanned systems industry. Lockheed, SRC, Saab Census, all of those companies are, are, many of those companies have been doing work for the military and they're gonna convert that technology over to civilian use and that's gonna drive job growth. Ah, my favorite. <laughs> Agriculture. Most people think killer drones. And then after killer drones, they think about spying police officers. But let me tell you where most of the work is going to happen, particularly here in New York and Massachusetts and now our newest partner, Pennsylvania. It's going to happen in agriculture. Countries have been using UASs. Japan has been using them since the 1990s. This is, this is made by Yamaha called the RMAX. It sprays about two and a half million acres per year in Japan in what's called precision agriculture. It can hit a spot one square centimeter, hovers over the field, farmer controls it or some operator controls it. It can, it can do all kinds of things that traditional agricultural implements cannot do. So this is what we're working for. We're working to get, and, and you know, there are others that build things. I, I just happen to like this one as my example. But this is what we're working to do. Get this kind of technology to our farmers here in New York so that we can feed the world. Now, this is another cute one. This is a little quadcopter with a, uh, with a, a uh, camera on it. Search and rescue, accident investigation, disaster response, hostage and shooter response. That's what you're going to see many law enforcement and first responders using that, that size UAS. 
They can put that in the trunk of a squad car, show up on a site, launch it, and utilize it. Real-time information right then, right now. But just to talk about something that we all remember was Superstorm Sandy. Had the 174th in Syracuse been able to fly their unmanned systems in the national airspace system, they could have restored cell phone service in 25 minutes, the trip from Hancock to New York City. That's, that's what the capabilities are. That, and that's just scratching the surface. Ah, the guys, I, I, I can't leave out my friends in Massachusetts. They have been a big part of this from the very beginning. And the two lead institutions, uh, academic institutions in New York is RIT uh, because of their imaging sciences division and MIT in Massachusetts. And what these guys are doing is they're working on development of a UAS that can deliver vaccines into places where you can't get cars, you can't get trucks. Um, one of my assignments in the military was uh, to open up the airfield after Hurricane Andrew hit Miami. And the way we got in there, we were airdropped onto the field because you couldn't get in there because of all the damage. Think of what a UAV can do in that kind of situation. Ah, Amazon. Thank you to Amazon for promoting the civil use of UAS. For those of you that might have seen it, another 60 Minutes broadcast of a month or so ago that showed Amazon working on a package delivery system that, uh, that will use UAS. Um, Facebook is interested in using um, the solar-powered Solara to provide internet access to parts of the developing world. What, what does that, all of that mean to us here in Rome? What that means is, is that we're going to be part of the cutting edge of one of the next great technological revolutions. The, what's going to happen, we think, is that once there's a commercial marketplace where people can earn money from their very good ideas, they're going to be UASs that are going to be developed by really smart people in their garages that are going to have applications that we haven't even thought of today. And we're excited that Rome and Griffiths and New York and Massachusetts are going to be leading the way. Ah, this is, this is uh, you'll see these guys out at Rome. Moog, or Moog, depending on who you ask, as a Buffalo company. And one of their uh, systems that they're working on is a remotely piloted vehicle um, up in this, uh, this corner up here. This is a Robinson R-22 helicopter. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with that brand, that was developed by Mr. Robinson to be the everyman helicopter. It's kind of small. It's kind of light. Uh, his, uh, his vision was everybody would have one of those in their backyard, and they applied to work. You know, that never really materialized. But what we can do with them is turn them into remotely piloted vehicles and do anything that's too dirty, too dangerous, too dull, and too difficult for manned aircraft. They're going to be coming to do some testing at Rome. Some other pictures of some of what they do and, and how they do it. This does point out, though, and I, I, I want to make sure that I'm clear, this is a technology business with an aviation component. There's also a ground component and a maritime component. And there is some possibility, and particularly the ground component, that we'll be part of that as well. Because the, the real nub of the development is the control units. OK. Short briefing, big subject, but I'd like to have your questions. Yes, sir.
That's correct. I would say two to three years, probably closer to two than three for a small UAS. The FAA has today some rules in draft form for the essentially what would be the commercial and civil operation of small UAS. So they're tied up in the federal bureaucracy somewhere according to the FAA. Um, they were supposed to have been published this spring for public comment, which is the way the rulemaking process works. Then after the public comment period, they'd go back and they'd either amend or adopt those rules and we would, we would be able to move forward. So I think the smalls by 2015, um, the bigger ones and the ones that actually fly, like the ones that FedEx want to use and fly in the national airspace system, probably take a little longer because one of the, one of the big challenges is what's being referred to as sense and avoid. In today's manned aircraft, a pilot has to see and avoid to avoid collisions, to avoid uh, any kind of uh, difficult circumstances that are out there, whether it's weather or other aircraft or what have you. That's the pilot's responsibility. UAS doesn't have that capability yet. So part of what we're going to be working on here at uh, Griffiths and throughout the New York, Massachusetts area is what's called sense and avoid. And we're going to start by putting some sensors in at Griffiths that can do some ground-based sense and avoid testing, and then we're going to work towards uh, airborne sense and avoid testing. So as you can see, that's a, that's a challenge. There is no solution yet. There's no cold fusion solution yet. Um, so I think, personally, I think it'll be a good three years plus before we get to full integration in the national airspace system of aircraft that are not flying under instrument flight rules. Aircraft that are flying under instrument flight rules now could be integrated. In fact, they are integrated into the uh, uh, positive control airspace because they have transponders uh, and air traffic control controls them just like they control any other airplane. They talk to the pilot who's, who may be sitting 2,000 miles away, but they have that communication capability. So that, that, that's, my, that's my theory on how long it's going to take. But to be honest with you, nobody knows for sure. I got to give, I, I kind of beat up on the FAA a little bit earlier, and, and deservedly so. They, they did drag their feet. But ever since this past um, winter, when they made these announcements, it's not the FAA I recognize. It's an FAA that has been forward leaning and trying to move this project along. So we'll see, we'll see how that attitude works, and that might advance that timetable. Yes, sir. It's hard to say autonomous and non-autonomous because part of the requirement for a controlled RPV is that it be able to do something if you lose control. It has to have some autonomy built in. It has to either stop flying, go in a circle. You know, there has to be some, some autonomous control. Totally autonomous, I think, will, will take some time, uh, mainly because of just the public acceptance. Um, I, for one, am a Star Wars fan. And uh, one of the great things that uh, you could do in Star Wars was step onto a shuttlecraft and say, take me to the other aircraft, and it, it would do that. No pilot, no, no nothing. I think we're a long ways away from that. But our testing is going to be primarily with uh, controlled um, RPVs, remotely piloted vehicles, where we've simply removed the pilot from the aircraft and put them on the ground. There will be some autonomy that'll have to exist in that craft if you lose link, and that's one of the things that we'll be working on. Probably not. It's interesting because. One of the things, one of the strengths of our application was the special use airspace that we already have in existence here in New York that has been carved out for a long time. 
And we thought that would be appealing to the FAA. And on our first meeting with the FAA, they said, oh, and by the way, we don't want you testing in special use airspace. This is all about integration, not segregation. And so what they've asked us to do is work with uh, just as any aircraft would work in any kind of airspace. What we have to do to get a COA to fly that test is we have to make a safety case and an environmental case for whichever airspace we choose. So in theory, we could go down to New York City and do Manhattan. That would be a hard, that would be a heavy lift right now uh, because the safety case and the environmental case would be very high. But that's where we're going. We're going towards just full integration of the use of these aircraft into the national airspace system. Yes, sir. No, I'm sorry, if I said that, I, I made a mistake. That's for smalls. Okay. Small, the, the FAA has only set up two categories right now. There are small UAVs, which are 55 pounds or less, and everything else. That's gonna have to change, because you can imagine what that everything else can look like. And so, uh, no, the testing for, for now uh, at, at uh, Stockbridge, at the Air Force uh, labs, is gonna be in that four square mile area using smalls. However, over at Rome, we, use, we already have permission to use the Class D airspace, which is the controlled airspace around the tower four and a half miles um, around. And we're building uh, airspace corridors through basically unpopulated areas to move from Griffiths into uh, some of the other uh, special use airspace. So for example, we've got a client coming out to take a look uh, about the middle of April, um, their uh, UAS weighs about 1,000 pounds. And uh, so we'll start out testing at Griffiths. We'll do just some taxi testing, you know, taxi it around, can you control it, can you bring it back, you're not gonna hit anything. Sure don't wanna hit Steve and his airplane. And, uh, and then we'll do some flying. But every test is gonna be done in what we refer to as a crawl, walk, run. You know, one day it might be nothing more than simply taxiing around and that's it. That's all we do. We take the data and, and then we take a look at what the next step would be. Although interestingly enough, the runway is so long at Griffiths, we have another client that figured out he could do five takeoffs and landings in the 11,000 feet that's there. So that might be the test. You might do five. So they're gonna vary. Yes, sir. Um, I'll give you a qualified yes on that. The, um, originally, when the FAA put these test ranges together, they said we couldn't partner with any federal entities. And they prohibited, strictly prohibited, federal entities from partnering. That's relaxed a little bit now. And in fact, the FAA has said, well, you know, we don't want to stop you from using what the military has developed in the form of safety management systems, their worthiness data, all that sort of stuff. So that's part of what we're, what we're gonna do. We do have um, a client that is doing some work for DARPA that has talked to us about uh, utilizing the facility at Griffiths. And so that's why the qualified yes. I don't know how deeply we'll get into it and how much of that DARPA information, as you know, when DARPA develops stuff, they're the, they're the blackest of the black agencies. And so we don't know, I don't know how far we'll get into that part of it, but yeah, we're starting, to, we're starting to make progress in partnering with some of the federal development. Um, I don't know. Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. That, that would be just fine. Yes, sir. Well, what we're gonna try to do, part, as I mentioned when I first started, part of our charter, if you will, is public education. So we're gonna, we're gonna use our website as a living, breathing, kind of here's what we're doing today area, so you can certainly, you're welcome to do that. Um, you, you're always welcome to contact me and I'll tell you what we're doing. 
Um, and we're going to do public events. We're going to go out and, and give updated briefings. Um, we're going to try to reach out to the public as much as we can. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. I'm glad you asked that question. First of all, there's no 400 foot limit. The FAA some years ago issued some guidance, not regulations, but guidance to model aircraft users. And they essentially said 400 feet or less line of sight, you can operate them, you know, you can't fly them inside uh, or, or uh, interfere with any commercial or air traffic of any kind. So that's where that 400 feet came from. It's not really a limit. Now, recently the FAA just lost in the first round a case where they essentially tried to enforce that limit uh, and said that they own the airspace from the ground to infinity. The judge said, well, maybe not so fast. So there, there's still some confusion as to what's going on there, but, but what we know will come out of this testing, the ultimate rules will not have uh, any altitude limitations other than what is the normal airspace altitude limitations about what you can fly at. Yes, sir. Well, you've, you've hit on really two of the biggest issues that are going to be determined through some of this testing. The answer to the, to the one about uh, utilizing the, what the military has developed, uh, to the extent the military will let us do that, yes, we're definitely going to do that. We're not, not trying to reinvent the wheel. The issue of um, security of communications is one that we're going to be taking up. Obviously, a part of what we, we have to ensure is that somebody can't come in and through manipulation of communications hijack your vehicle. So that's going to be a part of, of, of what's going on. And I've talked to a couple of the local companies uh, that are based locally, not the bigger companies, but based locally, that have, have done some preliminary research in that. But keep in mind that there hasn't been in the United States a civilian market where you can actually get money and, and make money and, and improve products and sell them for more money and you know all those things that cause the commercial engine to move. So they're all they're excited and we've been contacted by people that are in that business in the cybersecurity business, if you will, uh, to be a part of our team and and we're happy to have them. So far, um, we have talked to many local companies that have sought us out. Um, you know, we were just named on December the 30th. I mean, I'm not using this as an excuse, and we've been trying to operationalize our operation. But we're going to have business development people on our team, and we're going to have liaison people on our team that, that are looking to do that. We, as I mentioned earlier, Part of both the Massachusetts and New York uh, effort here is economic development. So we are we're going to be actively looking for local companies, local entrepreneurs that can help us solve these problems. So what I what I can say to everybody is keep an eye on the website. Uh, we're, we're updating it now from post uh, from our post designation, but keep in touch with us. And if you have an idea. I mean, that's, that's kind of what we're all about. We're all about ideas. You know, some are going to be wacky. Some are not going to be so wacky. Uh, some are going to need to be tested to find out if they're wacky or not. So that's, that's what we're about. We're about new things and new ideas. Yes, sir. Um, I can say that for us, new air. I'm, I'm going to say probably 25 to 50. Um, we have uh, currently we have a director of, of 
technical services, who is an engineer, a uh, PhD type engineer, been, been in the business for a long time. I suspect that he will have several engineers working for him. I don't know how many. Um, the way the testing works is that we have to put together a test plan. We, we have to have information management folks. We have to have safety folks. We'll have to have range, people just to do nothing but run the range itself. If, you, if we test today prior to, to range instrumentation being installed and we want to test outside line of sight, it's kind of manpower intensive. I have to have people who know what they're doing monitor the airplane either through a chase, air, uh, the aircraft, uh, either through a chase airplane or spotters stationed on the ground at, at certain reasonable lengths that can see. So all of that's going to take manpower. And, uh, and to be honest with you, I, I can't tell you exactly how we're going to do all of that, whether that will be a local company that, uh, that supports us through an independent contract or whether those will be our employees. But we're looking locally first to staff out the task. Yes, sir. Well, there's really two, two issues there. One is that because of our federally appointed test site status, we have to be open to anybody who wants to come test. Now, we control whether the test is safe and environmentally sound. We can tell them, no, we can't do that because we can't ensure the safety of the people on the ground. Uh, but the other thing is, is that we have been tasked, if you will, um, the sense and avoid solution. So those um, developers that think they have an answer to sense and avoid, they're going to be steered to us. Uh, the other ranges are, are doing some other stuff, um, but that's, that's our primary function here. So yes, we're open to anybody that, that wants to come out. I mean, we've got, we've got folks now from, well, the one I showed you, the, the guy from France, um, their uh, DT-18 is already certified in France. And it already works, uh, pipeline patrol and uh, electrical wire control, stuff like that. So they're going to come out, and, and all they're going to do, I say all, it's a big deal. Uh, what they're going to do is prove to the FAA that their machine meets US airworthiness standards. And then they'll get some sort of airworthiness certificate, and they can go out and commercially use that DT-18 or, or sell its product. Uh, and that really doesn't have anything to do with the sense and avoid aspect of it because what the way they fly their aircraft, it's a small, it's under 55 pounds, and the way they fly it um, is, is probably going to be permitted under another set of rules. The sense and avoid aspect of it are going to be the really the bigger aircraft that are flying in space with general aviation airplanes that are, that are referred to as non-cooperating. I don't like to do that because I'm a general aviation guy myself. So if you'd say somebody's non-cooperating, that makes them sound like the enemy, but they're really not. It's just the way aviation is built in this country. We have, and here in New York and Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, really no difference, we have a very active and strong general aviation community. Not so in other parts of the world. We have that here. And our general aviation pilots um, if, if I were to hold up a, an aviation map of New York, you would see hundreds, literally, of little dots. And those are private airstrips where people have their own airplane and they just come out and take off and they don't talk to anybody and they don't want to talk to anybody. So we've got to figure out a way to be safe but not limit what general aviation can do today. Okay, no other questions, comments, cries of outrage? Well, thanks again. Oh, yes, sir. Yes. Any place I can scare it up. Uh, what's that? Yes, yes. There was no money from the FAA, but that may change. Um, 
but the state of New York has put up some money. Senator Griffo and Assemblyman Brindisi have been kind enough to uh, help us in, in that arena. Um, the Empire State Development is, uh, is looking at uh, giving us some state money. Most of the, um, I don't have the slide up there now, but most of the other groups were funded either by the state or by the university that sponsored them. In our case, because we started out as a not-for-profit, we were funded by private donation and in-kind services. Just to submit the bid, we raised 250000 in cash and about 700000 in in-kind services. Like, I worked on the project for a year for nothing. Um, and, uh, and as did a lot of big companies. Lockheed provided both cash and in-kind services, uh, SRC, that sort of thing. People, that, uh, obviously companies that have a vested interest in commercial success. So now that we've been designated, we're still, I mean, we're still looking for operating money. Like I say, the state has come up with some money that gets us going. Uh, we are a fee-for-service organization, however. So if you come test with us, you, you're going to pay. Um, so that, that, that ultimately will be the revenue stream that supports the test ranges and everything else. But the, the seed money, the startup money, is coming from uh, various sources, including private sector sources. Um, we also are in the process of teaming with companies. Companies that need a test range to develop something are using us as their test range teaming partner. And, and that, that's a potential revenue source as well. Yes, sir. We will be in about a week. We, uh, we're going to take uh, half of one of the old nose dock hangars. It's about 14,500 square feet. We're putting some office space in there and um, some storage space and things. And, uh, and so that, that'll, that'll become our primary operating area. Right now, we're hanging our hat in a cubicle in Syracuse. So I'm anxious to get moved. Um, center, remember I told you Center State CEO is one of the benefactors. So they, they, uh, they're helping me out right now by letting me uh, hang out at their offices. At, uh, on, uh, they just moved to some new office space on West Fayette Street. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, yes, we, we have authority to test in all of the airspace of New York and Massachusetts. Now, having said that, each test is conducted under what's called a Certificate of Authorization or Waiver, COA, C-O-A. And that COA gets into the specifics of the test. And in that COA, we have to, whatever airspace we are going to use, um, we have to persuade the FAA that it's safe, much, much like what happens today when you have an air show. You know, FAA comes in to wherever the air show is going to be, and you sit there and you draw out the space, and you say, this is what we're going to do, and the Blue Angels are going to perform in here, and the Thunderbirds are over here, and it's safe, and everybody agrees, and you go forward. Well, that's kind of how the COA process works, too. We're starting, however, with some existing approved airspace, the Class D airspace that's controlled by the control tower at Griffiths, the COA that's already in place at uh, Stockbridge, at AFRL Stockbridge, and the fact that Joint Base Cape Cod is state-owned by Massachusetts, and they've already approved the testing of smalls. In fact, MIT has been using it for some time um, to test smalls just inside that restricted airspace at Joint Base Cape Cod. So that, that's kind of, that's where we could go tomorrow to test if you wanted to do that. But we are already, already mapping out like for the guy with the 1,000-pound UAS. We're already mapping out some other airspace for the COA to conduct that test. Okay. Well, thanks again for having me. Check our website. There are ways to contact us through the website. Uh, my, my email, I think, yeah, is up there. It's lbrinker at newair.org. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have that you think of later on. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all again the next time I'm here. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm sure Larry will remain around for a few minutes should you have any additional questions that you'd like to talk to him. On behalf of SUNY IT and SUNY BEST, we appreciate your attendance at today's presentation. Hope you found it informational and educational. And uh, keep on the lookout for additional programs that SUNY BEST will be providing.